Um, so thank you all. And now I'm actually going to turn it over to um, one of the individuals who was integral in this process of developing these RFPs um, and has really provided a tremendous amount of expertise and guidance throughout this process. Um, going to turn it over to Manuel Portillo, uh, the Director of Community Engagement from the Welcoming Center for New Pennsylvanians. And he'll um, talk a little bit more about our process. Sorry, folks, having a little bit of technical difficulties. All right, Manuel, you're on. Great, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited about this opportunity and thanks so much for your interest. I'll be brief, um, uh, but I wanted to give you a sense of um, our goals uh, for the community fund. Um, you all know by now that this is about promoting wellness among refugee and immigrant communities, not just in Philadelphia, but in our region, in the southeastern uh, Pennsylvania re region. Um, it's important that um, we all understand that um, the goal or the goals of this community fund are to uh, support uh, our communities uh, and promote wellness um, through various kinds of uh, approaches and methods. Um, by that we mean that we value um, approaches that um, are community-based, that are based on the values and the cultural situation and the perspectives of people. Um, we also um, want to favor and, and support approaches that uh, consider the whole person um, so not just uh, the kind of service or the type of service that an individual um, requests when they come to us as service providers, but an approach that uh, pays attention to the whole human person and, and his or her context, which uh, in my experience, as you know, requires a lot of listening. Um, our goal is also to, um, and, and this is very important, to make sure that um, you know, we, we want to move beyond the strict clinical approach to wellness and mental health. Um, we all know that there is a lot of people who have been doing that, but when it comes to refugees and immigrants, we need uh, more innovative, um, open approaches, um, approaches that integrate, are more integrative, uh, make it more accessible for people, um, et cetera. And more than anything that are based on uh, people's uh, cultural situation. We want to recognize, we want to celebrate diversity in Philadelphia, and so this fund is uh, very focused on, on doing that, um, moving away from the, um, you know, the traditional approach. Um, and we also want to invite and challenge the Philadelphia and regional um, philanthropy community so that they can engage in this kind of process, um, supporting uh, the community and the organizations that are in the forefront of um, addressing the issues and the situation that affect people and family um, families in our communities. Um, next slide, please, um, Caitlin. And we want to give you a sense of how this came about. Um, to be quite frank, this is a you can think of it as a startup, um, but basically. Um, funders, um, the partners, the, the, the participating funders uh, basically um, contribute um, some, um, some funding to a pool and together that pool is now uh, roughly around 200,000 uh, and I say it's a startup because I, I think this has a lot of potential and the, the funding pool will definitely grow as we go. Um, this uh, scheme that we have here basically means that uh, once uh, the funding pool is in place, um, then a uh, granting group, which is being facilitated by the Scaragood Foundation, uh, comes about and uh, guides the whole process. Um, we have been engaged in this process uh, since uh, June of last year, 
and it's a group of, Caitlin will tell you more details later on, but it's a group of community-based organizations that have come together uh, to work closely with uh, the Scatter Good Foundation to develop this uh, grant and this, uh, this approach. Um, the group uh, is going to uh, be the ones uh, to uh, make decisions about how funding is distributed. I think that's important for you to know. And as you will notice in the RFP, um, there are three levels of participation. Um, so there is tier one uh, for mini grants, uh, tier two for the more programmatic um, support, and then the tier three, which is the largest grant, um, which involves um, uh, applicants, uh, you know, um, developing a partnership so that they can deliver um, on the grant. So um, basically, um, these organizations have been um, developing the process and the ideas behind, um, you know, how this uh, grant is going to uh, to work. Um, we'll keep you posted about uh, how this develops, but uh, for the moment, these are the organizations that are participating in the um, in the granting group. So uh, next slide, and I will leave you with Caitlin, who is going to uh, lead you through the rest of the um, RFP. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Manuel. Uh, we really appreciate it. And um, I am going to run you through some of the more some of the important information you need to know to apply, um, which is really what. I would assume most of you are on this webinar to learn about. Um, so first, I do want to say a huge thank you to our greening group. Um, the following nine organizations have been uh, really providing tremendous expertise and uh, time and hard work towards this process um, and have been incredibly thoughtful and collaborative. And I, we really, it's been a joy to work with with each and every one of the representations from, from these nine organizations. Um, and we were uh, fairly intentional in who we selected for these nine, um, nine organizations, trying to get a diverse group from all over the city and that you know, really serves a diverse array of immigrant refugee populations and uh, gets at many different dimensions of wellness um, from things like workforce development to the arts um, you know, to sort of more traditional things like just physical health and mental health. Um, so a huge thank you to, the, to this group. So I do want to kind of give you an overview of how we're thinking about wellness. And this is uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Services Administration's eight dimensions of wellness. Um, so we want to really go even broader than these eight dimensions. And there are, it will be some information about our core values, which you know includes a focus on wellness, um, but that we really see wellness is kind of all encompassing and that we need to be getting at things like, you know, job opportunities and legal status. And um, in addition to attending to the, you know, mental health and physical health of the populations that you all are serving. Uh, so just wanted to give you kind of that broad frame that we're working under. So uh, what are the criteria to apply for this, for these grants? Um, so one, the pro it's, programmatic support largely um, and the program must serve immigrant populations in a community setting um, so really trying to focus on those community-based approaches that move beyond the, the clinical approaches that say would have would require like a DSM diagnosis um, in order to receive care um, we that we're promoting wellness through integrative holistic practices again kind of getting at that um, point of making sure that people are treating individuals in, as whole people in, within their context. Um, the organization must be located in serving immigrant populations in southeastern Pennsylvania in the five county regions plus Berks. Um, so Berks, Bucks, Chester, Delaware, Montgomery, and Philadelphia counties. And the organization must either be a 501c3 or have a fiscal agent. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that because that is based on tiers. Um, so there are three requests for proposals. The, each of the tiers has a separate request for proposals, um, but they're 
So the tier one will be for micro grants. Um, and those are for one to $5,000 for building the capacity of the organization to deliver a wellness related program. Um, so some examples might include a staff training or professional development, say um, you've been delivering a program and you realize that your staff really needs support and training in trauma informed practice. Um, so these grants can really go towards that kind of thing. Um, additionally, if you are interested in buying a computer for a wellness related program that you've been um, working on, that would be another another thing you could do. Or if you just have a funding gap um, for a wellness related program and you really need a little bit of general operating support to close that funding gap, that would be another another way to use these dollars. So tier two is uh, for up to $30,000 to start a new program or expand an existing program. Um, and then tier three is really that support for collaboration. And these are larger grants. Um, they start, or they, you can go up to $50,000, uh, again, to start a new program or expand an existing program, which relies on the collaboration of two or more agencies and organizations. Um, so for all three, you can have 501, you can have 501c3 status. Uh, to apply. For tier one, however, uh, you are allowed to either have 501c3 status or have a fiscal agent. Um, so really just two, tiers two and three, you must be a, a, a 501c3 in order to apply. Um, but tier three, we are largely asking for information on the lead organization. So if the lead organization has a 501c3 status and the other organizations that they are partnering with don't, that would also be fine. Um, so just trying to provide a little bit of clarity there. Um, so I, I, also, I hope we mentioned that there's a total pool of $200,000. Um, and the way the grant tiers will work is that we won't have a, uh, a set amount that, we'll, that we will be granting in each tier, um, but that the grant group will really be committed to um, having taking a cohort approach to making decisions and that we'll be thinking not only about the quality of applications but also the diversity um, of the cohort so making sure that we have representation from uh, several different areas geographic locations and that focus on a number of different types of programming um, and so we will be making the decisions about you know there might be one tier three grant that goes out there might be three or four programmatic um, support those tier two grants and you know however many micro grants we're able to give out as well so um, we will be deciding that kind of more on the back end so I will now go on to actually take you through the process and and take you to the application to kind of show you a little bit of what that looks like um, so um, we are now on the Scattergood Foundations. We are not on the Scattergood Foundations page. Give me one moment. Okay, so um, you can click to the Scattergood Foundation page um, for the Community Fund for Immigrant wellness. Um, so you can also see here if you are on, I'll click to our home page here and you will see that we, you come, the Community Fund for Immigrant Wellness comes up on the home slider there. Um, but you can also just hover over Community Impact and just go right down to Community Fund for Immigrant Wellness. So first there's a little bit of information about the community fund. Um, we have some information about our granting group and the fund's mission and core values. Um, so I'll just click on that to show you a little bit of what that says. So um, this goes through our mission statement and our core values. And as you can see here, um, there is that, uh, those eight dimensions of wellness with a little bit of a definition for each um, and talks about some additional factors um, like cultural wellness, relational wellness, and legal status. Um, and then, you know, we go on to have a total of seven core values. So I would definitely recommend looking at that before you um, go on to apply. 
And then it you know, talks about our criteria, about the tiers, and then here's where we get to the good part. Um, so uh, we have the grant applications and more information. And I do wanna just show you quick the application requirements and FAQs. If you click on that, you'll be able to download a user guide, which has some more information and um, frequently asked questions for, for you all to kind of go through and, and you know, get a, any answers that you um, might have questions for. And we will be adding to the FAQs as questions come up. Um, so making sure that you all know that that will be um, kind of a, a changing document. So then we'll go ahead and click on apply today. Um, and this will take you to a page that if you don't have an account through Foundant, which is our online grant management, um, program. If you don't have an account, you'll actually be able to look at the three applications. So as you can see here, there are the tier one grants here at the bottom, the tier two grants, and then the tier three grants up at the top. And you can just click to preview the form and you can see the full form. You have some instructions and introductory information um, and it goes through sort of what the full application is. So I will kind of scroll up and then I just also want to show you that you are able to, by clicking on question list, you're able to download a PDF form of the actual application. So in case you want to print it out and take a look at it, you're able to do that. So I'm going to go back. And you see here, you can't actually apply because you have not logged in or created an account with the Scattergood Foundation's found in page. So we'll click here up at the top right hand counter, corner that says log on or uh, create a new account. Um, so I'm gonna log in to a test account, but I wanna show you to create a new account, you click right here to create a new account. So if you haven't applied through um, our found in system before, uh, which we, it is relatively new to us, so probably most of you haven't, um, you'll have to create a new account. And this will go through um, your organization name and some basic information about your organization, um, your executive director, and you know some any other information from there. The one thing here is that uh, if you are applying for those micro grants and you are applying as uh, an organization that doesn't have 501c3 status but has a fiscal agent, um, you will be required to actually use the EIN or tax ID for the 501c3 organization that is the, your fiscal agent. So you'll have to complete this form. Um, but I am going to go back and actually just log in so we can show you the actual applications. So as you can see here, I've created a, a test applicant and it has some of that information pre-populated up at the top here that I created in my test applicant um, application or test applicant account. So from here, you will be able to um, click apply and there are two spots you can do it. You can do it up here in the left-hand corner or you can click apply right here. Um, and this is where if you have submitted any applications, you'll be able to see the applications that you're working on or that you have submitted. So I'll just click apply. It'll take you back to this page, but um, with the three applications. But as you can see that there's these apply buttons um, on the right hand side. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start actually with tier two and I'm gonna hit apply. And it'll take you right to the application. Um, you'll also be able to download a PDF from, straight from here if you'd like um, by clicking on that question list but we'll, we'll take you through. So um, first we wanna just make sure that you've looked at all the instructions and that you understand that you're applying for tier two for, for programmatic support um, because you will be allowed, all organizations will be allowed to apply for all of the tiers for as many programs as they would like. So I certify that I have read the above instructions 
and uh, then we'll be in filling out the or the application. So at this this first section um, of the the real application, it says organizational information. So this is just kind of some basic information. Um, the first question is that EIN number again, or the your guide store organization ID. So um, if you do have a guide star account. If you click this little logo here, you'll be able to see that you'd be able to copy your GuideStar profile into the application. So that just means that you'll be able to pre-populate some of the application areas. Um, you'll also be able to edit those areas if you want, if they, they've already pre-populated. So we'll go down. Um, so for, again, for the programmatic support grants, those tier two grants, you will have to be a 501c3. So we've asked for your 501c3 designation letter. And we'll ask for your mission statement. And um, then we'll also ask you to describe your past your past experience serving uh, immigrants and refugee communities. We just want to make sure that, you know, folks have some experience with these populations. Um, and that's kind of the, the gist of the organizational information. And then we get into the program information, which is really what you'd be applying um, applying for. And it you know gets into some the amount requested. Um, just make sure that if you're applying for tier two, you can only apply for up to thirty thousand. If you're applying for tier three, only up to fifty thousand. And again, that micro grants are are one thousand to five thousand dollar grants. Um, and then for tier two, you'll have to submit a grant budget. Um, you can upload in, in a Microsoft Excel form or a PDF. Um, we'll have some information about uh, the grant start date and end date, and the, the grants will be on a one-year cycle. And some other basic information, um, just making sure that the program meets our, our basic criteria. And then the third section will get into the the tier two specific questions. So, um, you know, the greening group decided that they really wanted to ask questions about how the program that you're submitting ensures that you're honoring the culture of those served, that you're, you know, taking cultural linguistic competence into account, and that you're, you know, really prioritizing those culturally sensitive um, ways of, of providing programs. And then we'll um, ask for a few outcomes. We ask for three of your top prioritized outcomes to be measured. Uh, we really want the outcomes to be identified by the organization that is submitting. Um, and we you know, feel fairly strongly that we, that really the organizations on the ground will be the ones to best be able to talk about the, the outcomes that make most sense for the populations that they're serving. And we will also um, be providing some technical assistance and consultation for those who um, receive grants that they will be able to partake in some training about evaluation and ongoing quality improvement to really be able to measure some of the outcomes of the program that they are submitting for, for this grant process. And then we'll just ask you to agree to our terms and conditions, and those are listed on our website. You can link to those here. Oh, I do wanna say, so you are able to save and come back to the application. So you can save the application here, or you can submit the application when you're done with it. So just remember that um, you're able to, to save and come back, which is great. So I just wanna very quickly go through um, some of the differences between the, the tier one and tier three from the tier th two. Um, so tier one is a little bit simpler, you know, largely because it is for less money. So we will ask, right here, we'll ask if um, you're a 501c3 or if you have a fiscal agent and that you upload some information about that fiscal agent if you are not a 501c3. Um, also just want to note that the, you know, the grant start date and end date can be less than a year. I mean, if you're asking for dollars for a computer, that kind of is just a one, a one time grant um, check that would come to you. And then we'll get into the, the one question that we're really asking for the tier one micro grants, uh, which is really just how, 
how is the micro grant being used? Uh, we just want to know how it will build the capacity of your organization to, to deliver the wellness related program for which you're applying. And then we'll get into just a couple of the differences on the tier three application. Collapse this. And um, so the organizational information you will see we are asking for the lead organizational information. Um, so really just having that one organization provide the information about the, the program. Um, and then we will ask for the collaborating organizations that are involved. And then the rest of it is fairly similar until we get to this last section. So the tier three support for collaboration section. Um, so like in tier two, we will be asking questions about cultural sensitivity and outcome measurement. Um, but we'll also be asking a little bit about collaboration and partnership. Um, so we'll be asking really why, why you believe the collaboration enhances the program and why the particular partners who um, have been selected to be involved, why they're involved in the process. What expertise do they bring and what kind of uh, niche are they filling that maybe your organization um, didn't have that, that expertise to begin with. Um, and then just to make sure that all of the parties um, have agreed to, to what's in this application, we will ask you to upload a document that describes the role of each of the partners involved and just indicate that you know, everyone agrees and is on board. And that can be uploaded either as a Microsoft Word document or as a PDF. Um, but we would probably prefer a PDF um, so that we are not able to, to kind of change it if by accident. So um, those are the three applications and you're welcome to get on our website now and, and take a look around. Um, and we um, will now go to some questions and we have three questions already. And I'm just gonna pull it back to So, um, all right, so um, one of our questions uh, is, will families affected by Hurricane Maria um, in Puerto Rico who have been forced to uh, move to the area, um, basically will, will <laughs> those individuals from Puerto Rico who have moved here um, because of the dire circumstances there, will they be able to apply? And, um, you know, we will check with the grading group, but I think absolutely yes. Um, that definitely would make great sense. Um, so then the, the other questions are, are the nine organizations who are reviewing the applications eligible to apply? And that is, we do have that in our FAQs and the answer is yes, uh, but they will not be able to review their own application. Um, so we understand that there are, you know, are potential conflicts of interests and uh, we have created a shared decision-making process to kind of keep those conflicts of interest at bay. Um, so, but yes, they are they are able. Um, and what, what is the incentive to them for participating in the initiative? Um, so we did, um, you know, I think one of the incentives is to really kind of break down those um, communications and th between the funder and the grantee, um, but it was a lot of time. Uh, so we did provide a small stipend to each of the organizations for, um, for in, participating in the process. I'm going to pull up some of the other questions. Um, all right, so. So um, one of the questions is, did you say that the one organization could apply for one tier for multiple programs? Um, so we specifically created three different applications so that organizations would be able to apply for as many programs as they want and in as many tiers as they want. Um, so we recognize that this will be a lot more review time, um, but if 
say a nationality service center has several or several programs that they want to apply for um, and they want to apply for a program um, in tier one, two, and three, they're able to do that. I'm trying to run through all of these questions. So um, so we so the one year grant cycle um, so we will be making the designations or letting the, the grantees know that they have um, either received or not received a grant on May 21st. And the grant cycle, or not, sorry, not May 21st. Um, actually, let me, let me get that out. May 10th, I believe. Um, and we will be having a kickoff event on May 21st. Um, so really the, the grand cycle will begin and end sort of in late may early june depending on sort of what you what you say in your in in your application all right so will this fund um community-based research projects related to your organization's immigrant services um so Absolutely, yes. Um, but, you know, I think really one of the keys there is that, um, you know, we will have to make sure that those research initiatives will be community based and and really kind of respect in the community that they are are working in. So our programs for all ages eligible to apply, including school age refugee youth. Absolutely. Um, so really, from as young as a baby or providing you know prenatal care all the way through older adults absolutely able to apply um, so there are definitely a couple questions about those um, about the the grantee or about the tiers and again you can apply for kind of as many as you want all right, so we have another, um, as you've explained, the community fund is using a broad definition of wellness, um, but if our proposed program focuses on strictly legal status, employment, or housing, is that enough? Or do we have to um, touch on some traditional aspect of wellness too? Well, I think that you know all of those things do definitely go, to, go towards a person's ability to be well. Um, and I think what we would really ask you to do in that particular situation is that you explain how that promotes wellness um, and just say how you're really attending to the whole person uh, rather than just providing information about legal status and that you're that you kind of are taking a broad approach to actually providing those services as well. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, so can we apply in partnership with one of the grantor agencies? Um, so I might ask for a bit of clarification, but I think if you're asking, can you apply in partnership with one of the granting group agencies? Absolutely. Um, just, you know, making sure that you're either starting a new program with them or you're expanding an existing program with them. We understand that um, the granting group all of those organizations have a really broad reach and that they've partnered with tons of organizations throughout the region. So we definitely would encourage those, um, those folks out there who have a partnership with the granting group agencies to apply for the dollars with those, with those granting group agencies. So an agency can apply for multiple grants, but can only one be chosen? This is a great question. And you know we actually struggled with this quite a bit. Um, and we decided that we kind of wouldn't provide a, an answer up front. So um, I recognize that that's you know, not, a, not a solid answer, but um, we will be really making those decisions based on the full grantee cohort. So you can apply for multiple grants, um, but do keep in mind that we are interested in having a cohort that is diverse and that presents um, 
uh, that you know goes through a number of different populations and uh, in a number of different geographic locations. Um, so I would you know kind of be strategic that way in choosing which uh, which tier to apply to and which prog programs to apply for. Um, so do we have a deadline for submission? Absolutely. Um, the deadline is March 29th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And um, that is a, a Thursday evening. And um, that information is listed on the website as well um, as, and in the, the application um, requirements and FAQs. And that, so that gives about a seven weeks, uh, seven weeks to, to do the application. Um, so can we get a database with the first tier? I might ask um, I might ask the the individual who asked that to kind of clarify that question. Um, so do all the the beneficiaries need to be immigrants? Um, what if the program serves seventy percent immigrants? So I mean, I think this is a great question. I think um, you know you'll have to kind of um, be really clear and we do have a question about what population is served um, through the program in the application so i think you'll just have to be really clear about who is uh, participating in the program and ensuring that the immigrants that are being served through that program are being served in a culturally competent and sensitive way that you know there are um, language competencies available to them and that you know folks are really um, you know, being served in a way that honors their, their culture. So is it expected that this fund will exist beyond the initial, initial grant year to support second and third years of pilot projects initiated by the participating grantees? So this is a great question. Um, you know, what we have decided is that the Scattergood Foundation will put another $100,000 towards the community fund. Um, I do want to note that the community fund, you know, it has grown to $200,000 with some amazing support from the United Way and from the Patricia Kind Family Foundation, who have also provided an additional $50,000 each. Um, so this kind of really depends on how we're able to um, to fundraise for future years. Um, so we will be doing a second year and we will be getting back together with our granting group um, to kind of talk about what went right in this process, what might have gone wrong, what we want to improve. And that might mean that we will be working with the the year one grantees and moving forward with them, or it might mean that we might be just doing those those year one with those grantees and then asking for additional grantees in, in years two and three. Um, so where that's kind of a, a to be determined. All right, and then we have, um, how are you ensuring sustainability and longevity of the initial $200,000 granting pot? Is there a long-term or short-term, is this a long-term or short-term project? So um, I think, you know, this kind of ties in with the last question. Um, and, you know, we have been just so thrilled with this process and would really like to continue doing it um, and would really are hoping to raise more money for, um, still for year one and then additionally for, um, year two and then hopefully years three four and five um, but that is again it's kind of to be determined unfortunately but it is something we're absolutely thinking about um um so then I do want to get to the, I think, trying to see if there are other questions here in the chat box. So is it expected? Nope. Kind of answered that. And then is an organization who serves immigrants serving nonprofits eligible? Um, it does not serve immigrants directly, but strengthens to work. Um, strengthens the organizations who do serve them. Um, 
you know, we, that is, a, that is a really good question. Um, and I think it kind of really just depends on the application. Um, I would say that, you know, we, we would likely shy away from, from that, but I'm not entirely sure and can, can get back to you on that, that particular question. We have another. So are there specific budget restrictions that we should consider, like restrictions on salaries or indirect costs? Um, so no, um, just include in your budget um, that you upload some information about all of those things. And um, we will, you know, I think one of the things that you should note is that the select part of the selection criteria will, um, the granting that the granting group will be going through is um, whether or not we believe that the, the program is fe feasible within that budget. Um, so if you have a, you know, a, a program that costs $60,000 and um, you're applying for that programmatic support for $30,000, it would probably um, be a good thing for you to, in your budget, to say the extra $30,000 is coming from, you know, money from this area, just so that we have an understanding of that. Um, but no, there are not specific restrictions on, on what you can spend on salary and, and other things like that. So um, can a grant from the community fund pay for our entire project or do you want us to have other funders? So um, nope, it can pay for the entire project if you, if you want. But again, if the community fund grant doesn't um, cover the full cost of the program, we would like you to have other funders or other funding sources. So it might, um, you might be receiving some funding through uh, Medicaid. And I'm still a little confused about this question, I guess, but um, for the database for the, the first tier. Um, oh, um, so, so if, if you're asking for a particular software, um, so yes, yeah, if you wanna use the, the money to um, have a, uh, have a, a subscription to um, what like Salesforce or whatever um, that that would would be one way to do it um, but you, you know just being really clear that you have to sort of talk about how that would really um, how that would really kind of improve your organization's uh, ability to provide a wellness related program so are letters of support helpful or necessary? Um, so we actually don't have a place in the application for um, letters of support, uh, but you know, if that's something that you'd like to do and send them in separately, we can, we can figure that out, but they are not necessary, no. All right, so we had a lot of questions. Um, I do want to see if there are any final questions before we log off and we'll be adding those, you know, those questions and um, And we'll uh, get those into the FAQs so that folks who are not able to join for the webinar can also have answers to those questions. All right, I'll give it another minute. But I do um, want to note that if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, my contact information is C O'Brien at scattergoodfoundation.org. And that is spelled wrong there. So don't spell it Foud, Foud Nation, but foundation. Um, and um, feel free to, to reach out with any additional questions. But we're hoping that this application process is relatively low barrier um, and that you know you all are able to uh, really submit for all of the phenomenal programs that that you guys are providing to the community um, that you know all of which promote wellness and make people's lives better Whoops.
Um, all right, folks. Well, it sounds like people don't have um, any other questions. So I'm actually gonna, gonna sign off a little bit early and let you guys get 10 minutes back. Um, but thank you guys so much for participating in the webinar. And we will post the recording of this onto our website. And um, feel free to let other folks that you know who are providing excellent programs uh, that there is an application out there. Um, and if you know any funders also, or if there any, are any funders on, on the webinar, please let them know that we're, we're still fundraising. Um, so we want to be able to give as many grants as we possibly can. And, you know, growing the, the fund is a huge part of that. Um, so thank you all so much and uh, look forward to your applications.